Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'd like to begin with a short video. Prevention of HIV, it begins with me. Hello, what can I do for you? Doctor, I've heard a lot about HIV, but I don't really understand what it is. Could you explain, please? Sure. It's a very serious health topic. HIV stands for human... This is the story. This is the story. This is the story of a breakthrough. Breakthrough in the global fight against HIV and AIDS. This is the story. This is the story. This is the story of a new approach. A new approach to prevention. Prevention. That outperforms anything else in the world. And is designed for those who need it the most. In their own language. In their own language. And respecting their culture taboos. This is a story of pedagogically grounded, pedagogically grounded, evidence-based software from Stanford University that in a few short years, a few short years, has become a movement of more than 100 NGOs and 30 nations and hundreds of volunteers, and hundreds of volunteers from around the globe who have donated their time, talents, and celebrity to the movement. This is the story of millions of boys and girls, men and women who, for the first time, Know how to prevent HIV and AIDS. This is the story of Teach AIDS. But this story has just begun. Our vision is to provide this life-changing software free. Free. To everyone in the world who needs it. In the next five years. But we can't do that without your help. Without your help. Without your help. Because this story is also about you. And what you do right now. So when I began this work, one of the very first questions I got was, why do you want to go into AIDS education? Given that this has been a problem for the last many decades, isn't this a solved problem? But it turns out it's not. Because of the taboos and because of the stigma, HIV is extremely difficult to talk about, let alone teach about, especially in certain parts of the world. And despite millions of dollars and countless uh, efforts and uh, hours that have been spent on the problem, the knowledge level still remained pretty low. So over the last many years, since 2005, a team of interdisciplinary experts has come together from the various fields of medicine, public policy, communications, education, human-computer interaction to solve these persistent problems. And after several years of research at Stanford, we were able to invent a tool which was the most accepted as well as the most effective. So in 2009, we spun out of Stanford and became our independent uh, social nonprofit. And today, the materials are used in more than 70 countries around the world and are distributed by more than 180 different organizations from around the world. So one of the questions we get these days is how did you get so many organizations from all these different countries to use your software? What these organizations invariably tell us is the answer, is the quality of the TeachAIDS materials. In fact, the story of TeachAIDS is a story of quality. But many people don't understand what quality is, and in fact, the people who appear to be most concerned about quality are often the ones who understand some parts the least. There's a lot of popular knowledge and wisdom that supports the idea that being obsessive over quality is overrated. So perfect is the enemy of good, paralysis by analysis, or be decisive. But you know, Sometimes a little bit of thinking before you act is actually helpful, as exemplified by some of our friends on The Simpsons. I've narrowed your choices down to five unthinkable options. Each will cause untold misery. I pick number three. You don't even want to read them first? I was elected to lead, not to read. Number three. <laughs> so, as you just saw in The Simpsons video, this common set of business philosophies is essentially encouraging leaders to stop spending so much time thinking and just start doing something. But for some things, that's exactly the wrong approach. Quality matters. And sometimes you have to get a product right for it to be the best, 
and sometimes you have to get it right for it to work at all. In discussing teach aids with others, people with good intentions always have helpful suggestions on how to make things more uh, efficient. Sometimes you really can discover amazing new ways to make things more efficient. But very often, those suggestions merely show you ways to cut corners which you really shouldn't cut. I want to share some stories with you where an emphasis on quality is the reason our product succeeded. First is the story of translations. In order to provide the greatest access to our materials, we are going to have to create more than 80 unique languages from around the world. India alone has 26 languages which is spoken by more than a million native speakers. So we have our work cut out for us. On a weekly basis, we get folks contacting us saying, you know, these are great tools. Just send it to our country and we'll dub it. Or I have friends that speak this language and it's easy to translate this. In a world where translations, whether for movies or for educational materials, are created often, this seems like an easy problem to solve. But let's take a look at the problems related to translations. Machine translation. We use online translation tools to make sense of articles in different languages all the time. But machine translation is unfortunately still almost completely unable to understand idioms as well as retain the essence of many words. So here's a famous example from Star Wars, Revenge of the Sith, dubbed into Chinese and then back into, uh, subtitled back into English. It was translated into Star Wars, Backstroke of the West. The famous scene that you see on the bottom there with Darth Vader, you might remember, he says, no! Well, that was translated into, do not want. <laughs> human translation. Movies are dubbed into languages all the time by actual humans who are professional translators, which are also riddled with all kinds of mistakes. For medical information, like with Teach Aids, this is, of course, completely unacceptable. The exact meaning of the words must be retained. So we use this translation and back translation process to ensure quality is maintained in every language. So what we do is we actually start with the English translation and say we're translating into Spanish. So we get the best possible translators and uh, people who know how to speak about HIV in those countries. So they take the English version and they translate that into what they think is the best Spanish translation. Then we take that Spanish transla translation and we find folks who speak English and Spanish and we give them only that Spanish translation and say, hey, can you translate this back into English? And they've never seen the original. So they think that they're translating this for the first time. Then you look at that new English version and your old baseline English version and you find all these problems in your original Spanish translation. So then you go back to the Spanish translation, make corrections there, and then create yet another back translation. You do this over and over and over until your final English translation is similar, very similar to your original English translation to ensure that you have great, uh, a great translation. And by doing this process, we have actually avoided uh, un uh, unbelievable uh, complications and mistakes uh, before they got into the market. So for instance, when we were getting the Mandarin version in China translated, we were actually working with people who are professional translators who teach about HIV in that context. And what they had done was taken every instance of the word breast milk and translated it into milk. So you can, you can get HIV from breast milk, but you can't get it from any old milk. And so when uh, in the back translations, the students were going through that, they were asking, so do you get this from cow's milk or goat's milk or what kind of milk? And so we had to go back and make sure that everything was accurate. Or another example was when we were translating into Hindi. So it turns out that every instance of the word cure was translated into the word treatment. And in looking into that further, so for HIV, there is no cure, but there is treatment, great treatment. And when we were looking at that, what happened in the, in the language, it turns out that in a number of Indian languages, the word for cure and the word for treatment are exactly the same. And so we had to find a workaround solution for that. 
The next story is about balancing comfort, clarity, and brevity. So if you look at the picture up here, these are actually pictures from AIDS and uh, sex education materials out there. We really want to make sure that we are balancing comfort as well as clarity to maximize efficacy in learning. So the bottom uh, picture there with the stick figures, again, extremely comfortable to look at. However, it's unclear what is happening in this picture. Are they friends? Are they lovers? Are they hugging? Are they kissing? It's unclear. So you have very high comfort levels, but you don't understand what's happening. Or the other extreme with like medical illustrations, we have explicit images, which are extremely clear. However, a lot of educators don't want to use these pictures. Students feel uncomfortable using these kinds of pictures or disseminating these pictures after looking at them. But even more importantly, we know that when you're, not un when you're uncomfortable, that that limits learning. And in many parts of the world where um, sex education is banned or it's difficult to talk about AIDS education, such pictures are actually not allowed. And so we had to be very careful in picking the different kinds of pictures, and this was all a research-based process. And what we discovered was that it's actually these 2D Disney-style animated characters which were the most comfort, comfortable and which uh, promoted the most amount of learning. However, most people with the best intentions when they're developing materials, they create what they think is interesting and don't have this research to back it up. And sometimes this causes more harm than it can cause help. So an example of this is how the HIV virus is portrayed in education materials. So these are actually real examples. In many cases, HIV is shown as a devil-like character or a gruesome character. So here are some portrayals of that. They're made to look this way because it's cool, it's entertaining, uh, it personifies HIV through a storyline or for a number of other reasons. However, the research shows that this actually increases the stigma. And so the devil-like characters make people more scared of the virus, and it makes people who are living with HIV feel horrible about themselves. So we had gone through hundreds of iterations in the storyboard process and paid special attention to the kinds of characters that we use, particularly with HIV. We stayed away from the devil-like pictures because it increased stigma. However, when we tested the more cartoonish pictures, so the one in the center there, what we found, or what the, res what the research showed, was that people weren't worried enough about HIV now, and that it didn't look dangerous enough. So we finally ended up going with something that was more of a scientific representation of the virus, which solved all of these kinds of problems, which is the picture on the right there. Here's what some of the pictures from the animation look like. And again, not understanding the research behind the depiction of the characters, uh, and the 2D figures, we often get people saying to us, you know, no one does this 2D style anymore. This is an old style. You should go with something more flashy, 3D animation, more realistic looking. And often they think that we are going with the 2D style because of budgetary constraints or because of the level of sophistication of our equipment. But what's been especially interesting and surprising is that because the industry has moved away from 2D animation and more towards computer-based 3D animation, it's been extremely hard to find animators trained in the style that we need to actually promote um, education and efficacy in the materials. But our priority is still education. And as a result of using this research-based methodology with the pictures, we've reached comfort levels of 98% in areas that have the highest stigma around the world. So, and while at the same time, significantly improving knowledge as well as stigma, reducing stigma. Similarly, when we conducted extensive research on exactly how long the materials need to be to have a complete knowledge of this kind of education, we found that the, the great timing would be between 20 and 23, 24 minutes. And so that's how long our materials are based on which language version you're creating because in just some languages it takes longer to be able to say the same thing. But a video game version would take much longer to teach the same amount of information and a shortened version would lose critical information. However, sometimes 
and especially when we first started developing the materials, we had people coming to us saying, can you make a five minute version? Um, it's easier to show on television and other places. And I remember one of the Stanford professors um, saying that Albert Einstein was once asked if he could explain the theory of relativity in one word. His answer was no. There are so many awareness campaigns that most people in the course of one year are exposed to more than 25 minutes of this kind of awareness. But our belief is, wouldn't that time be better spent if you're receiving actual HIV education? So if you think about it, you don't, you don't get math awareness or physics awareness. You actually learn those subjects in school so that you can get a complete coherent conception of those materials. And in the same way, it would be great to do uh, this with HIV-related work. The last piece of our story is about how business processes need to be of the highest quality to maximize efficiency and efficacy also. Again, based on rigorous research, here's an overview of our five-year plan. We hope to create enough language versions to provide the best HIV prevention education to those around the world who need it most. So of the 50 countries where the problem is most severe, there is some version of teach aids being used in all of the countries that have the blue lines on it. And in Botswana, which is the green country, we've been able to create a full language solution. In the next five years, we would like to develop enough language versions to cover all of these 50 countries, which would serve 90% of the locations where HIV positive populations reside. But if you look at this, and you look at all of the countries around the world, there are many ways to, to uh, strategically look at this problem. And there are many ways to tackle it. One way is to start by creating versions for all the areas where more than one million people are infected. Another is to look at the countries where there's a greater than 10% of the people that are infected. But we've discovered that by creating language versions for these 50 countries, that we can bring HIV education to 90% of the areas where HIV populations are concentrated. So finally, I'd like to leave you with this. Figure out what is the core of your product success and don't settle for anything less than the best. Two, customers may use your product for a variety of different reasons. So quality in all aspects pays off. And number three and most important, Use data wherever you can get it. And where you can't, the real innovation may be in inventing a business process to do that research yourself. Thank you. Thank you.